Hi everyone. We have a super special episode today. I mean, how many of you guys have not seen the Netflix series on Halston? Well, today we have the honor and privilege of interviewing one of the original Halstonettes, Chris Royer. She was actually one of the models that was at the Battle of Versailles in 1973 and has a tremendous collection of Halston pieces that she has collected over the years under the careful scrutiny of Halston himself. And she's been a real generous soul in loaning many of her pieces and speaking to many interviewers as well as many people online just to keep the spirit of Halston alive. So the way we're doing it is on Zoom, which we've never done before because Chris is on the East Coast. and. Uh, Hope you enjoy it. It's going to be in two parts. So here we go. We have the great pleasure of having Chris Royer here, who is one of the original Halstonettes. Chris worked with some of the great models of the time. And of course, I'm getting goosebumps on the back of my head, worked with the late, great Roy Halston. And now with the popularity of Halston due to the Netflix uh, series that came up, um, we thought it was timely to actually connect with you. And I so appreciate the fact that you made yourself available. So welcome, Thank Chris. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Great pleasure. I I wanted to have this more of a conversation because um, my YouTube series is really about um, maintaining the historical relevance of fashion. And Halston made such an impact on fashion then and now, and he will continue into the future. So I don't want to do all the talking. I want you um, to share your experiences and then perhaps towards the end, we can actually talk about the battle at Versailles. Sure, absolutely. So absolutely. I know you started uh, in 1972, I believe, as his fit model. Yes. Um, why don't you take us through some of your um, history there? Okay, well, I think the way I met Halston was sort of typical or very unique of, of that time period, uh, how Halston acquired his girls. Um, I had uh, gone to uh, Pratt Institute and I was uh, shown in Mademoiselle, uh, a, a young uh, magazine for uh, stylish, you know, for stuff, a little like Elle magazine today. And uh, they had done an article on Chris Royer has style. And so what happened was that, uh, I had just gotten back from England and my agent at that point was Wilhelmina, who was very dear friends with Halston. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, she uh, had uh, said, I have the perfect match. You have to go, go uptown to 68th and Madison. I want you to meet Halston because coming from a design background, I wanted to be involved in design as well as model. Wow. So uh, I went up to 68th and third and um, 68th and Madison Avenue, sorry. And uh, I entered uh, downstairs uh, and then you take up this elevator and you go up to the third floor. Uh, the, the doors open to the actual salon and the salon was done in this amazing sort of creamy, wonderful color uh, that just made you feel good. Mm. And uh, the whole room was all done in, uh, the couches were done in creamy ultra suede. I thought it was suede, but it, it looked like it was ultra suede. And uh, you had wonderful Brazilian music on. The floors were bleached, uh, you know, so they looked white marble. And uh, it was a very chic and, oh, and Rigo candles, Cypress, which was a very amazing fragrance at that time. It was a little fresh, but it was a little uh, um, sexy and, and sensual. So the environment was amazing. And right on the couch was this amazingly tall, dark, really good looking, really good looking guy. And so I walked in, I said, hi, I'm Chris Royer. And he says, we know. And I thought, 
we do. Oh, uh oh. <laughs> okay. And at that point, I have to remind everybody that uh, during the 70s, there was a turning point because uh, no one really knew the designers as you do today. Right. They, would, they would they would say the name of the company. Uh, but they would not, they, you would not know what the designer looked like or his point of view. It would just, you would just see the clothing. And this was the time when a lot of them, like Bill Blass was under Maurice Bretner, and then Bill Blass created Bill Blass Company. But that was the beginning of a lot of these designers photographing themselves, you know, after that point, so that, you know, the public would know what they looked like. So anyway, let's get back. So I sat down next to this very handsome guy and he goes, oh, we just heard that you just came from London, you know, and we, I'd love to hear about what happened there. You know, what is the scene like there? And let's take a look at the clothes and we'll try them on and everything. So I proceeded, the clothes fit beautifully and we had great conversation, but it was quite lengthy. And I thought, where's Halston? I guess, you know, I passed so far, but where's Halston? So I proceeded, I said, well, I guess I got the job. And he nodded and I said, well, I have a couple of questions. And he goes, okay. And I said, do, uh, how old is Halston? Because I thought it was more of authority, wasn't as casual. And he says, old enough. And he goes, why? I said, well, does he have like a sense of humor? And he goes, Yes, yes, <laughs> of humor. and I'm like, well, and it goes, why? I said, well, you know, we, I, I told you I'd like to get involved in design. So let's say if I start modeling for a couple of weeks and then could I gradually also be involved with the, the creative part of it as well? And he goes, oh yes, we can manage that. And I'm thinking, this is fabulous. This has never happened, you know, like, Wow. And I said, I just have one more question. He goes, okay. And I said, well, since you and I get along so well, could you tell him that we could work together? <laughs> so he says, yes. And then all of a sudden, one of the assistants comes in and says, Jackie O is uh, here for her uh, finnings. So I immediately turned around and I thought, Maybe Halston was behind the screen, or maybe he was overseeing this meeting. Halston was on the sofa laughing hysterically. And I'm like, God, you liked me. He goes, Oh, wow. No, you, you were interviewed and you got both jobs. I said, Yay. So that's how we started. Wow. What a fabulous first experience. We'll call that a first date. That's right. Great. Exactly. So Wonderful. that was beginning of this fabulous sort of like uh you know working with such a genius and a man of great wisdom and also vision because he sort of could pick and choose you know uh, his models and and also the way he wanted to uh develop his designs in that very sort of like uh instinctively i want to i want to excuse me i i just wanted to say that with your creative instinct and your collaboration with Halston, one of my favorite stories that I read when I was doing this, the research for this uh, conversation was when you were on Fire Island and um, the sarong. Can you tell us about that wonderful, that very sexy, very right. now dress that still transcends time? Well, it's, and it's iconic. It you is. know, it was in the model amused at the Met. Now, the, the method of how Halston used to work was uh, he used to love to sketch a lot. We were on a vacation on, on, on a Fire Island and uh, I had gotten out of the pool and I was wrapping one of those large field crest towels around me. Mm -hmm. And we were in a, uh, the home was actually, uh, was had sliding doors that attached to uh, the actual uh, swimming pool and the, the entire platform there. So we walked to the sliding doors, which were all mirrored. And because he, he always liked to work within the mirror, to look at it in the mirror. So he had a very unique way of tying it underneath and up in the back and then pulling it tight to the front. And he created these like little bunny ears. And we looked at it because it was very smooth and sexy. And we thought, oh my goodness, silk chamoose. So right. that was 
part one of the story. When we came back and we talked to the workroom and told them we're taking this field crest towel and make it to a silk chamoose, they were like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so they were like, you know, but he had because uh, he was using Abraham silk and we did one in hammered uh, uh, silk satin and it was like all on a width of 36 inches. So, oh. yes, yeah, so you didn't have that volume. So that's how he created the spiral cut on that dress. So that's that very VNA. That That is very, very much what VNA would have done. Exactly. He yeah. loved DNA. He was very impressed with the technique of bias cut. He wanted, he realized that with the bias cut, he could create a, a sensuality in the clothes, yet maintain a very elegant look because when you stood still, it was like sculpture. But when you moved, yeah. it was very fluid. It was amazing. But uh, that particular uh, sarong, he again would create it in multiple ways and multiple fabrics uh, because he did it in a velvet and he mm. did it in black velvet, which was stunning, you know, and he also did it in multiple uh, sort of prints. Uh, mm. And a lot of it was, it was uh, on uh, Women's Wear Daily Cover. Uh, it was called the It Dress and it had Lee Radswell, it had uh, Barbara Allen uh, and Barbara Walters wore it in a lame. And uh, he also did it in uh, various colors of lame. So the dress had, but each time he did it in different fabrics, he changed it to work with that fabric. Right, because so, the, the properties wonder, of the fabric are different. Yeah. He was very concerned about that. You know, I, I, I love the fact that you were privy to the light bulb going off in his head uh, when he came to a concept that would be um, congruous to his basically his DNA. So I, I, I so we know that VNA was an inspiration to him because of the bias cut. But I also saw like there's um he has the infinity shawl which I love and yes. reminds me so much of Charles James. Yes. Was he inspired by James as well? Yes, he actually employed Charles James uh, in the early, sort of the late 60s and for a short time and in the 70s, more like 71. So uh, before you got there, so you didn't yeah, get to meet him. I unfortunately did not get to meet him. Darn. <laughs> but one of, my, one of my schoolmates who was older, uh, he graduated and then he worked, we all seem to be hired by Halston in different ways. Uh -huh. But uh, because he liked Pratt Institute, but uh, th they had worked with Charles James and Charles definitely had, uh, I mean, he was, he was an, a genius to begin with. Right. Was like, I think there was this constant sort of fascination and respect with Halston saying, I'm dealing with a man that, you know, is so obsessed with the patterns that he he wanted to learn as much as he could with Charles James, but Charles looks were more uh, very strict, restricted and stuff. Right. Uh, Paulson's was more relaxed. So he took the figure eight uh, skirt and he made another version of that, that which, which was wonderful in, in a jersey uh, wow. and also did it in linen. Uh, mm -hmm. wore his rayon linens but the infinity scarf he created amazing infinity scarves uh in there and again each one was well thought out whether it was like a silk chamoose which was very soft and fluid or uh, a duchess satin or uh other you know fabrics that let's say that would be a chiffon each one looked so totally different because he right. thought patterns out so it wasn't a it was very well thought out yeah I have to say that when I was looking through the uh, uh, the file that you sent me um, that that was one of my favorite pieces just because I could see the uh, it's amorphous on so many levels and right. whoever styled those photographs did a beautiful job I, I did because wow, bravo <laughs> Thank you. We're great had, photographs. 
thank you. The, yeah. the photographer, E Prime, it was funny because we, I was advised by uh, Harold Coda to photograph my collection. And I thought, okay, fine. Little did I know, uh, it, it, that was another story in renting a mannequin. And uh, right. when I worked with the photographer, we honestly, we had, the stylists were wonderful, but I lived in Westchester and it was something that uh, I realized that I could do the styling because I know exactly what he'd want, you right. know, because I was there. So I know exactly how the, the, everything was supposed to be put together. I want to. I, I want to make, I'm sorry, I cut you off again. I apologize. Um, I want to make a, a, a point of how you were so prescient at the time uh, to, to realize the significance of Halston's clothing. And um, I read that you and your mother started collecting his pieces and that he would approve um, yes. the pieces that you collected. So how many pieces do you currently have in your collection? We have approximately 95 and, and that includes wow. shoes that go with the actual outfits, you know. And were these pieces that you actually wore as a model or that you bought for your collection? It was both because uh -huh. some of the pieces were uh, designed on me. And then what we did was that, uh, uh, you know, I would have a memo on it because during that time, uh, designers did not understand and a lot of people did not collect. That's very unusual. But, uh, you know, uh, Halston thought, or I should say Tom Fallon, who used to work with Halston said, of course he'd have you uh, do the, you know, start collecting because Halston never had time to collect or to do anything for himself. Right. So that's how, when, when it first started, it was 1974 and it was after Versailles. And because of uh, the shipping and sending and everything, the Fairy Princess glass dress, which is on the cover of Robin, uh, Robin Yvonne's book, Versailles, disappeared. And as the fitting model, you were allowed to, you know, choose one of the dresses from the collection. You so someone stole that? Gone. But wow. you know, during that time, uh, it, it was constantly dresses in, in all the designers when they were messengered out, sent to Vogue or to uh, Harper's Bazaar, you know, or town and country. A lot of those things happened because they just, you know, got, got lost through the messengers. So, you know, it was not uncommon, but it was like we reached a point where he said to me, listen, now's the time for you to just start collecting because I was collecting uh, what is the sketches and the other things because I like to collect. The Joe Eula sketches? The Joe Eulas. Yeah. Because the Joe Eula sketches were the croquis, were the little small four and a half by six and a half that Joe would paint uh, because we didn't have uh, Polaroids. There was nothing there. It was all uh, an artist illustrations and they were pegged on the board. And the way wow. Joe would sketch he would do three and then choose the best one and that would go on the board. And then once we finished with the collections, Halston had it made into an ad for Halston, the company, which was quite spectacular. But uh, that's the way but with getting back to the collection, it was important that uh, at that point I would take things immediately because some things were given away to other, you know, personalities and celebrities and people like that. And so things get, they disappear. Lost. Right. So you really have to, you know, you, we had to pay attention to it. So um, I would basically go to him, check it out, you know, and he goes, yes, because we felt that if I could get certain pieces that really represented him, that was the most important in the design because each one represents a different design story. And and I what I love is the fact that you had the foresight to do this, but that now, many years after his passing, you have been a champion of uh, making sure that people don't forget him and using your collection, loaning them to museums, talking to people like myself, but you know, doing interviews 
being yeah. interviewed by major magazines and newspapers. And even before the Netflix series, which kind of exploded his popularity, yeah. you were there championing, championing him. And um, I, I just, I applaud you for that because when you look back, and I do want to talk about the battle at Versailles, when you look at the significance of that experience and the pivot that that caused to focus on American fashion designers in the early 70s, you were, you were in the earthquake <laughs> and you were part of the models that were used in that miraculous fashion show that no one would have bet would have turned out the way it did. True. So can you talk about, I mean, not only the significance of him using women of color, which was not really done very much back then, and him breaking that glass ceiling and kind of cracking open opportunities for people that didn't have opportunities, but being able to blow out of the water major French designers. I mean, it's incredible. So can you talk about that? Sure. Versailles was very, it sort of came very quickly uh, because it also happened when uh, it was in the same month that he became, he sold his company and then became Halston Enterprises. Oh. Uh, so we had worked on the actual collection specifically designed for Versailles. Uh, and we, we, he was working nonstop. I mean, we didn't, we would not finish until two or three in the morning and then start at eight in the morning again to perfect it. And he had a very clear idea that for our particular segment, because the Americans used what was called taped music because they were on tapes mm -hmm. uh the backgrounds were pretty much uh blank you know and each one created a little something but the, it was basically the girls that that made the show for the americans for all the stiffness of the french thing the americans got out there and slammed him with this just this raw energy and we moved it a little bit, a lot of it, and in an extraordinary amount, and it just took over everything. Something happened there that night, and the French were willing to admit it. American sportswear was some, something that had to be paid attention to. There are moments in history that change the course of history. And that was a moment in history that changed the course of fashion history. The French had they had elaborate sets and yeah home kid they had a spaceship from Cardin. i mean they had a ballet they they had everything they had Gigi jean marie and the crazy horse dancer yeah it was like wow and then it was us who was pretty much minimalistic and uh each each one did uh their own sort of uh point of view where Anne Klein was more in the uh, more of a uh, safari African uh, motif, and uh, that uh, she actually uh, talked to Beth Ann Hardison on that one as well. Uh, but uh, you know, there you had Stephen Burroughs, who was really sort of like a young designer at that point, and it was all his sexy, lettuce edged, beautiful, bright color. Uh, you know, silk jerseys. And uh, in that particular segment, uh, we, we had to be careful because not too many of us could have loose hair because the things were flying off you so fast. <laughs> because the changes, the, the segments had to be minutes long. Right. Otherwise the music stopped everything. So everything, all the collaboration, all the movement on stage each each segment, we had to know what to do immediately, and that's why the choreography was very simple. But but but, but historically, you had Liza Minnelli performing, you yeah. had Josephine Baker performing, yeah. um, and at the finale, they not only threw their programs up in the air to bravo you once, they did it twice. Yes. <laughs> so viva l'American. Yes. It was, it was fantastic because it was like, it was very heartwarming, but it was also that uh, uh, you, we, the girls were basically, we didn't have time for a rehearsal. Right. They didn't really give us time for that. Uh, you know, so it was pretty much uh, the good old American style of like, okay, 
as Liza put it, let's get it together, girls. And like, Wing it. You know, this is this is it. Bring it. Yeah. So uh, that's what we did uh, with Halston. Particular segment he used uh, the music from the movie The Damned, and it was all little spots uh, where it was like uh, it was a dark set, and then the spotlight hit on Elsa and I in these amazing silk jersey dresses. Elsa was in white, and I was in white and black split in half. And I had a cigarette holder of Elsa Freddie design and Elsa had her compact and we were back, back to back. So it created a beautiful silhouette. And then as the music started, we start to turn. And then as we walked out of the spotlight, the spotlight went to another person and to another and to another. So each one had color or different silhouettes. And the silhouettes varied from uh, beautiful silk jersey ones. And then it went into what is the, called the glass dresses or the fairy princess dresses, which mine was very full, dropped to the waist and had a full, um, you know, uh, full skirt. But it was very lightweight because it was all gossamer. And it was a glacé uh, sequence on top of organza. It was amazing. That is incredible. So there was a lot of press about, I mean, geez, you guys were under so much stress. First of all, the French yeah. were not giving you any time. You know, it was like they were, they were not being very gracious. No. Um, and the pressure was on. Um, yeah. Eleanor Lambert, you know, with her incredible publicity skills, nothing could undo the tension that was there. And the press said that there was a lot of infighting. Was that just um, made up or was that true? No, there was the, the, the bottom line was that uh, our schedules, the infighting was wh wh what space and how can we get this together so it can be as organized as possible? Yeah. Uh, and the problem was uh, we didn't have access to food and we didn't have we didn't even have toilet paper okay uh the place the versailles that wow. was so falling apart it did need this event to 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 restore it because it was so i mean the doorknobs and the windows and everything there was no heat mm -hmm. in the place and it really needed the help so you know in the restoration so that was the good part but uh you know tension was mountain because, you know, each day we travel out there uh, from uh, Paris, we're in the outskirts of Paris, it would take two hours. And then it'd be, when do we get to rehearse? Mm -hmm. But they were constantly rehearsing on the stage. So we were basically sitting and waiting. And we were in more of the basement era trying to configure how we can possibly sort of orient the girls to, to, to figure out a make-believe stage and how to walk for each segment that we were in because so the, the girls were shared. So a lot of the segments went very quickly from one to another. Right. So it's like, you know, that one dress would be whisked off you and then you'd have to run over to the other side to make sure that you were the other dress <laughs> put on top and the other one was taken off you. I can't even imagine. I mean, it just the... <laughs> And then to have the finale that you guys did and the reception and the end result, the impact, it's still affecting fashion today. Yes. And um, so, you know, I wanted to ask you with all the materials that you saw um, Halston actually manipulate in his hand feel, work with on a dress form, one of the fabrics that was very popular and Stephen Burroughs used it too, was the matte jersey. It has a yes. wonderful weight, it drapes beautifully. And Halston used that a lot. In fact, um, many years ago, when Rachel Zoe was the creative director at Halston, I had acquired a collection of um, Matt Jersey pieces never worn from Halston. I think she bought at least eight or nine of them from me for the archives. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but yes. Um, I, I love, remember those. Yes. I love the Matt Jersey because of the fabulous. way it drapes. And yes. it's just so sexy and so sensuous. Do you think that um, the materials that, that Halston used, and including ultra suede, I mean, he didn't invent ultra suede, but he certainly brought it to the limelight. I think it was invited yeah. in 1970 by Japanese. Uh, Torre is the Torre, company. right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they approached Halston, they approached all the American designers. And, uh, you know, 
Hawson was the one uh, that basically said, yes, I love it. Uh, the others didn't see it. They saw it more for interior. They did mm -hmm. not see it for clothing because it's like uh, it's chopped up, you know, polyester. So it's more Microfiber. like yeah. So it has a different shape and, you know, consistency than other fabrics, especially suede. Even though it looks like suede, it still has to be constructed in a totally different way. But, but it was, was super it. expensive in its day and, and it cleaning it. Yeah. Yeah, it still is. You can yeah. spot it, you know, you can sponge it. Uh, it wears, we used ultra, we used the Torre Ultra Suede in uh, uh, the actual uh, luggage. So it wears very well, you know, Halston Hartman, we had a license for Halston Hartman uh, Ultra Suede luggage. It wears like iron when it's the heavy, heavy weight. But uh, wow. mm. he, he took it and they gave him an assortment of colors and weights in there. So the whole thing was very, very, uh, it, you could see the flexibility of, of uh, all ultra suede uh, if it's done right. And he would do it in the spring and summer in these beautiful colors, you know, of chrome yellow and greens and aquas. And he could create like little dresses out of it, you know. With he, totally, he cracked the door open for Touré. And uh, American designers like Vera Maxwell followed soon afterwards using ultra suede right. as well. I remember that. Yes, yeah. Vera Maxwell was the second one to, to use it, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it, but it was quite phenomenal. And uh, the famous dress 704, the ultra suede shirt waist dress, which is actually at the Met being yeah. shown now. Ethel Skull had it and donated it. Uh, but uh, that dress uh, shows he, he sold an unbelievable amount uh, on that style number alone because everybody from Mrs. Paley to everybody, uh, Barbara Walters. I mean, they all wore that dress because it was designed where he created where the opening of the actual uh, button was slightly lower. So it gave it more of a nice open look, but it held because it was, you know, ultra suede and it gave it a shape, but it gave it a sophistication and an elegance. And you could pair it up for the day, you know, you could wear your silver also pretty jewelry. And then at night you could wear your pearls and everything. So it translated to a lot of different lifestyles, especially in New York and Chicago. And, you know, uh, also let's say, you know, in Florida and, and Hollywood, they love that because they could, they could easily get into different colors and they look fabulous with it. I think the important elements are the very simple elements of people going out and buying it, wanting to wear it, wearing it out, looking terrific in it, and other people want to uh, look that way. I mean, there's no magic about fashion. Fashion's made by people. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Chris Royer. I certainly learned quite a bit um, behind the scenes information and because we had such a lengthy interview, there will be a part two. So uh, stay tuned for the next announcement, okay? Thanks for joining us. Remember, if you are not subscribed, please do so if you enjoyed it, of course. and. Uh, the other thing, too, is, is if you liked it, please give us a thumbs up. And we love reading your comments. So thanks very much for watching. Bye. If there's any advice I'd give to that public out there, I think it would be the advice of know yourself. Know what suits your purposes. Uh, know what works for your life to make you more attractive and more comfortable. And it'll work for you.